One of our absolute must do's for 2024 was to go and visit Japan. The key question was when to go. Many people go in springtime to go and visit the famous cherry blossom festivals. Well, however, we were keen for a different and more budget friendly experience. And if we could combine that with great animal experience, I know one member of the Flying Finnies who'd be very, very happy. We chose to go to Japan in winter because seeing the snow monkeys had always been on my bucket list. And of course, Graham has read Shogun a thousand times, so convincing him to go was pretty easy. Once we started researching our trip, we realised that there are so many unique things to do in Japan that can only be done in winter. Of course, Japan is well known for its amazing ski fields, but we wanted to look a little further. And what we uncovered was a range of snow and ice festivals all over the country that looked truly spectacular. So we started working our itinerary around these snow and ice festivals and we ended up being in Japan for over a month and we were not disappointed with this decision. What we realised was that Japan is really easy to get around and at the moment it's also incredibly inexpensive. The food is amazing and even outside of the snow festivals, winter in Japan offers a great destination for travel. In this video, we're going to show you five unique winter events, including the Sapporo Snow and Ice Festival, Hirosaki Castle Winter Festival, and our absolute favourite, the Snow Monkeys. We'll also take you to a couple of others that, while fun and funny, probably wouldn't make it onto our lifetime bucket list. So come on our journey through winter in Japan, and I think that you will agree that it's a great time to visit. Sapporo is on the island of Hokkaido, so it's right up north. It's the coldest place in Japan, so it was a good place to start our winter in Japan tour. And the reason that we went there is because they have this amazing, huge, uh, it's literally called the Sapporo Snow and Ice Festival, and it was it was incredible. It's most probably the most well-known of all of the snow and ice festivals. This is one that I had heard of before I started researching the trip. Of course, my experience with Sapporo was mainly around beer. And so when Tracy suggested it, of course, that, that was just a no-brainer. But the Snow and Ice Festival was, it was amazing. Yeah, it was really comprehensive. So there are three main sites um, for the festival. The first one is in the centre of town. It's this great big long promenade filled with ice sculptures. And when I say ice sculptures, they're massive. They're Some of them are the size of actual buildings. And that goes for like two kilometres up and down this big park in the centre of town. And then there's a second site where it's it, it, they're smaller ice sculptures. So they're carved into blocks of ice. Now this was a little more commercial. Um, a lot of them were sponsored by beer companies um, and had a really different atmosphere as well. We didn't see that one during the day. We only went in the evening, but um, it was fun. The third site was a stadium outside of town. And this was primarily designed for families of young children. So it's filled with uh, games and rides that you can do in the snow. So there was a sled ride, there was little slides that you could go down. So we went there, it wasn't really designed for people of our age, but we had fun, we had a great day there. It was very cold. <laughs> it was really cold. And unfortunately we hadn't fully planned for that, so we had to buy a little bit of gear while we were there. And visiting there in the evening was just spectacular. Best thing is, all of those activities are absolutely free. And so for budget conscious travellers like ourselves, we hardly spent a cent on entertainment. Now, it would be really difficult to try to work out what our favourite exhibit was because there was so much variety there. Some of the snow sculptures were professionally made. Some of them were amateur, semi-professional um, sculptors. They were still incredible. That makes it sound like they weren't good, but they were incredible, amazing. So best exhibit for you? Oh, that's really hard. You can't go past that huge... It was like a whole, almost like a castle, and it was lit up beautifully, and they changed the colours of the lights on it. Um, but I really enjoyed actually seeing them carve an ice sculpture. So at the second site, the smaller site, there was someone there actually working on blocks of ice, creating um, spheres, and, the, and then in front of us, they actually created a whole fish, and they did it. You know, it was about this big. <laughs> it's like fishing, but no, it was big. And they did it in front of us in the space of like, I don't know, 10 minutes, I guess. So it's quite incredible to 
watch people work in real time like that, especially for someone like me who has zero artistic talent whatsoever. So I was super impressed. For me, it had to be the Queen exhibit. Uh, it was just sound, noise, it was everything that Queen would be. And it was a, a really, really good thing. Some of the other great things to do in Sapporo include, of course, the beer museum. Sapporo is really well known for brewing high quality beer. We spent around about two or three hours going through the museum. It included a little bit of a tasting at the end and it was magical. It was a beautiful factory surrounded by snow. Um, what a great place to drink beer. Embarrassingly, it was actually our first stop, I think, <laughs> while we were there. The other great thing about Sapporo, of course, is the food. Just off to the side of the ice sculptures was an area called Ramen Alley. Mm. Very, very popular. A whole range of little tucked away restaurants with huge waiting lines. Um, but we were able to get into a lovely little restaurant and enjoyed some beautiful ramen. Really different ramen too. I think it was like a corn um, miso ramen. But again, great atmosphere, great food. Another benefit of being up in that part of the country. We didn't really have to spend a lot of money on any of the activities at all. One thing that we did spend some money on was going up into the Sapporo Tower, which provided a great vantage point where we could see all of the main snow sculptures sitting down below us. We caught the lift up and then we actually walked down. Now that was cold, walking down there at night. We went up at night, but that was really the only thing we spent money on while we were in Sapporo other than food and beer. <laughs> Travelling to Sapporo was relatively easy. We took a flight from Tokyo, from Haneda, and flew directly into Sapporo. And you landed a fantastic accommodation. It's not usual for me to book accommodation super early. I'm a last minute planner by nature, but because I knew we were going for this festival, I was concerned that it might be hard to get accommodation. So I found something really good value. I think it was about 50 Australian dollars a night, which for Japan is really inexpensive. And it was really conveniently located. We could get public transport into the main part of town really easily. It was really warm. And by Japanese standards, it was actually quite large. Very large. So overall Sapporo experience? Highly recommended. I know I do that a lot, but um, I loved it. <laughs> it was great. Another great place that I think turned out to be my favourite overall was Hirosaki Castle. Now we travelled from Sapporo to a city called Amori. So we stayed outside of Hirosaki because to be quite honest, at this time of year, Hirosaki Castle and accommodation there was extremely expensive. And you could get to Hirosaki in less than an hour. So it was really convenient and it was quite a nice place to stay actually. It was a nice little town. So getting to Hirosaki Castle, uh, we could take the train directly into the city itself and getting to the castle was a very, very short walk, around about 30 minutes or so. We went past lots of moats before we actually even got inside the castle grounds. So that kind of set up the atmosphere really nicely. Whilst Hirosaki Castle is good by day, by night, it is absolutely amazing. So there are things to do during the day, but really all of the action occurs after dark. The main focus of the Hirosaki Castle Festival is a whole field down by the river of Kamakura. Now Kamakura are little igloos which are lit up from within. So after dusk they light up these igloos and you just have this amazing field of all these lit up igloos. They're just, it was just beautiful. I was totally blown away by that. Most probably the highlight for me though was as we were heading down to these Kamakura was a massive snow flurry that came in over the top of Hirosaki Castle. Now the castle itself is a 1600s fortified castle with moats around it and guard towers, beautiful red bridges that span through 
amazing gardens. But then to have these snow flurries coming down over the top of the castle itself was absolutely magical. It was. It was such good timing. And I mean, you can't time these things, but we're just so fortunate to be there when that happened. Really, really, really special. Now, Hirosaki Castle is one of those things that you can do as a day trip or really a half a day trip. The limitation, of course, is that it's only held over a very, very short period of time each year. Yeah, it's just usually one weekend. So you have to obviously plan your trip if you want to go there um, at the right time of year. Definitely worth it, though. It's much smaller than the Sapporo Snow and Ice Festival, much smaller. So you can literally do it in less than half a day. So my recommendation if you do go would be to go closer to dusk. So see it during the day, but you don't you don't need to be there for a long time. You can probably get by, you know, an hour before dusk really to see it and wait for those lights to come on, which makes it really special. Now they do set up a couple of stands where you can get a bite to eat. We had some beautiful Japanese strawberry donuts. <laughs> and also, whilst not as large as Sapporo, there are a couple of snow sculptures there as well. So again, Hirosaki Castle, my favorite. It was really beautiful um, and definitely worth going. Um, but just smaller than Sapporo. So I guess it depends what you want to do. I mean, we were happy to do them both, obviously. Um, but if you had to choose one over the other, there's definitely more to do in Sapporo. So we've talked about my favourite activity at Hirosaki Castle, but without a shadow of a doubt, Tracy's favourite would have to be the snow monkeys. Absolutely. No doubt about that whatsoever. It was on my bucket list and it did not disappoint. I had the most amazing day there. I absolutely loved it. Now we made the decision to stay in nearby Nagano. Nagano was known for hosting the Winter Olympics a number of years ago. It's a beautiful, beautiful place, but it is a little bit of a journey to get from Nagano to the Snow Monkey Fields. There's a number of options or ways to get there. You do have the choice to stay in the town near the Snow Monkey Park, and it's a beautiful little onsen town. It's filled with hot springs and beautiful little, you know, family-run onsens. And that was really appealing. And I was really tempted to book there, but it was prohibitively expensive for us. So that's why we booked in Nagano. And I wasn't disappointed again in that decision. The accommodation Nagano was literally a quarter of the price of the accommodation in the town close to the Monkey Park. So very good for our budget. And Nagano actually was a really beautiful town. We really loved being there. So getting to the Snow Monkey Park, there are a couple of options. You can either take an express bus or as we did, you can take a train. I wanted to be there as soon as the Snow Monkey Park opened and the express bus left a bit later in the day. So it didn't get you there as it opened. Um, it was worth it. You get to see the local um, area when you're doing that. So it gave us a little bit of a different experience to get there. And then of course, there is a little bit of a walk to get into the Snow Monkey area. More than a little, it's about a 30 to 40 minute walk. And it's, I'd call it a hike. because You've got to walk through the, the forest to get to the actual Monkey Park. And it is proper forest, so there's a trail obviously, but you're walking amongst these beautiful trees. Again, it's a gorgeous walk in, um, but be prepared. There was not a lot of snow this year. It was a pretty low um, snow year, so we didn't really need our crampons or proper boots, but it was really wet and muddy. Still needed to have um, good solid walking shoes on to get in. Did the lack of snow lessen the impact of seeing the monkeys? Not at all. No, there were still plenty of monkeys and they were still having a lovely time bathing in the hot springs. No, it didn't at all lessen the experience for me. I'm sure it would have been a bit more aesthetic, you know, it would have been, it would have been more visually appealing if there was more snow on the ground and around the actual pool that they swim in. But not at all. The focus for me is just being there with the monkeys, watching them do their, you know, watching them just live their lives as monkeys do. It was, it was incredible. I loved it. You can tell by the smile on my face, I'm sure. Now, there were a couple of monkeys in particular that you enjoyed. There were a couple of babies that were cuddling oh. together and also yeah. a grandmother. 
I think it was the grandmother. So there were two little baby monkeys that were snuggling in to keep each other warm, sitting by the edge of the pool. And then there was another, um, what I presumed to be the grandmother of one of the, another baby, and she was just sitting there protecting it from the cold as well. So I sat there watching them for probably too long, but it was a lovely, lovely, lovely way to spend a few hours. Now the monkeys just walk through all of the crowds. They seem to be absolutely unconcerned with the packs of people that were there. When we got there, there must have been around about 100 people or so in and around the pool. There were plenty of people, but it wasn't super crowded, so you could still see the monkeys. You could all sort of get a, you know, say front row view pretty much. Really pleasing for me was that everybody was really respectful of the rules. So the rules are obviously very strict for good reason. You can't feed the monkeys, you can't touch the monkeys. You meant to stay a meter away from the monkeys at all times. Staying a meter away from them is actually impossible. So you don't actually walk towards the monkeys. They just walk towards you. They're literally walking between your feet at various times. So it's almost impossible to abide by that rule, I guess, as long as you don't force yourself within a meter of a monkey. When we left the park, we decided to take the express bus back to Nagano. Again, that was a really good decision. It was a great service. So I can see the attraction of taking the express bus in the morning, maybe getting there a little bit later. Even if we had done that, we still would have had a great experience. Absolutely, I was surprised. My concerns about getting there as it opened probably weren't justified. Um, so we probably could have had a couple of extra hours sleep and still had a really great experience. Now, unlike some of our other winter experiences in Japan, there was a cost associated with seeing the snow monkeys. We purchased a ticket from the Tourist Information Centre in Nagano. Mm -hmm. It was a single cost which covered both access into the park and also our transportation, whether by train or by bus. It probably saved us a little bit of money, but it was more the convenience of not having to buy tickets along the way. It is important if you buy that ticket though, that it's only valid on the day that you purchase it. I just have to say that the monkeys did not disappoint. Sometimes with things that you really look forward to, um, I get worried that you're going to be disappointed by it. But it, the actually, in this case, the opposite happened. So I was really looking forward to it. I'd wanted to do this for a very long time and I enjoyed it even more than I thought I would. Graham literally had to drag me away from there. I could have sat there literally all day. I could have. Probably all week, actually, if I had been allowed. <laughs> you want to stay all day? <laughs> do it. You must do this if you ever get the chance to. So it would be reasonable to say that there were a couple of places that, whilst great to visit, most probably wouldn't be on our top to-do list if we were to go back and visit Japan again for the snow festivals. That's very fair to say. The first one of these was the Kinagawa Festival, and it's another festival that's built around the Kamakura, so the igloos, the beautiful igloos that we saw at Hirosaki. Now it was promoted as having around, I think it was 800 of these little um, Kamakura lit up at night on this, again, a field beside a beautiful glacial river. And it looked incredible. And they also um, promoted that they had large Kamakura, so large igloos that you could actually book to have dinner in. It all sounded fantastic. It was a long way off the path for us. So we had to get to the Nikko area, which is kind of a national park area. And there's there's quite a few ski fields in that area as well. So it's very um, geographically beautiful, the area. But there's not a lot to do there other than skiing and or this festival. It started off not great. So we arrived in the town nearby that we booked accommodation in. And on the way there, Graham discovered that it was the third ugliest city in Japan. It's probably <laughs> a little bit unfair to describe it like that. There were a whole lot of great things to do in Nikko. There was a beautiful steam engine ride that you could do if you wanted to. <laughs> And there were also a couple of cultural events. 
in particular the Ninja Warriors. Oh yeah, they were just that was just random at the train station one day, wasn't it? So there were some good things to do, and we had a really nice evening in a kind of mom and pop type of bar having dinner. Yeah. But apart from that, it really was an onsen town. We got to enjoy the onsen in the hotel that we were staying in. That was that was really great. Yeah. But it was a little bit of travel to get out to the snow festival. It took us about an hour, probably a bit more than that, on another bus to get out to the festival. And when we got there, it was a tad disappointing. So I think it really suffered from the lack of snow this year. So it, it lacked atmosphere because of that. So they still lit up the mini igloos, but um, they were kind of, it was kind of like they were in a field of dirt rather than a field of snow. And even more disappointing, the big igloos, they had closed those so you could no longer actually have dinner in them. So that was pretty disappointing for me. Now we were able to have a really nice walk around the area, this beautiful bridge, um, and just walking around the snow fields and the, the river cutting through the middle of the town was fantastic. What they have done really well there is to stage part of the snow festival inside a historic village museum and when it was lit up at night and there were quite a few people having a look through it did look quite magical but would we recommend doing it probably not it was a long way to go for a small festival and maybe we'd just been spoiled because we had been to Hirosaki as well and seen the beautiful igloos there so maybe that also meant we we're a little disappointed in this one so Another festival that most probably wouldn't be on our bucket list again either was Marioka. Now, one of the great things about being slow travellers is the ability to be able to change your itinerary. And in this instance, we were literally walking through a train station, saw some great posters for the Marioka Ice Festival. Yes, they promoted it as this the coldest area in Honshu. And they put this fantastic um, picture up of an of this ice cave with icicles hanging down, and it looked incredible. So we were literally going to the train station to buy tickets to go to Tokyo, I think, and we decided that we would make a detour on the way there to go and see this um, this place. <laughs> now, the great part of all of this was actually the drive to get to Marioka, and it was literally a bus trip through regional Japan. It was really beautiful bus ride and this event cost us so the bus ride was included I think in the cost of the ticket to get in so but the bus ride was probably the highlight of the day. There is a man-made ice cave in Marioka which has almost like ice stalactites and stalagmites dripping down through it and it does create a fantastic visual effect but it's fairly limited. There were a couple of other things to do there as well, including a couple of sled rides, which Tracy took the opportunity to try out. Oh! <laughs> Nobody was injured in the making of this video. It was great to try something a little bit different. And even though it didn't work out perfectly. We had a fun day there. It was an unplanned thing. And unplanned things usually work out for us. So look, we found some funny things to do there. We got a bit of a laugh out of the day. There's a there's a headless bride and groom in here, which I've got to just, It's like horror movie theme park in a weird kind of way. Not intentionally though. But when the best thing about it is the ride out there and the free soup that they gave you as part of your entry, it's fair to say you can probably miss this festival. In some ways it was so bad it was funny is what I'm trying to say. Mm, but yeah, I don't want to say it that way. Oh, I say sorry in Japanese, I better check. <laughs> That's what I mean, I'm struggling with. We also visited main cities, Tokyo, Kyoto and Osaka. Now they weren't the main focus of our trip, the winter festivals were, but it was really great to see those cities during the winter. They're cooler, it's easier to move around. We have previously been to Japan, but it was in summer, high summer actually. So it was very hot and humid in that um, southern part of Japan. So this was a much more pleasant time of year 
to actually experience those big cities. One of the standouts for me was Osaka. We had previously visited Osaka. We decided to spend a few extra days in the city and again, we were not disappointed. The difference between those three cities of Tokyo, Kyoto and Osaka is incredible. Yeah, it's quite stark. So obviously Tokyo, massive city, lots of different neighbourhoods, very crowded, but quite, um, even though it's crowded, I'd describe Tokyo as quite calm and ordered. orderly. Osaka is the opposite. Again, it's a big city, um, but not calm and not orderly. It's full of activity. It's full of life. The people are more gregarious, more outgoing, I think. And we had an absolute ball there. And all of that counterbalanced by the cultural centre of Kyoto and a day spent walking the Philosopher's Trail, which was just brilliant. Yeah, that was a real highlight as well. Kyoto is beautiful. The architecture and the history and that walk down the path. I said to Gray when we were doing that, I could do this every day happily here. Now let's have a chat about cherry blossoms. We're a little bit excited because even though we're not here officially in cherry blossom season, the first buds are starting to emerge. So we were a little disappointed when we were planning this trip. Well, not disappointed, but thinking wouldn't it be great if we could also stay for the Cherry Blossom Festival. We didn't have time. We needed to get on to another place. Um, but as it turned out, our time was actually really good. So we, because we were there for the whole month of February and just the very start of March, um, we actually got to see the cherry blossoms just budding and just starting to come into bloom. So again, we were really fortunate and that may not always work out that way, but maybe the less snow meant a slightly warmer winter, which meant the cherry blossoms bloomed a little earlier than expected. So we did get to see cherry blossoms, not in full bloom, but I feel like we've had that experience. And again, we had that experience without the crowds that you have during um, you know, sort of late March and April when they're really full on blooming. So winter in Japan. We loved it. We would highly recommend going in winter, even if you're not a skier, because there is plenty of things to do, plenty of things to see, and you might spend slightly less money doing it at that time of year. Time to fly. Time to fly. See you next time. Mm -hmm.